Hello friends, Namaskar, this is Sanjay. Welcome to the 18th video in this series and the title of this video is Basic Processes of Teaching and Learning, Children's Strategies of Learning, Learning as a Social Activity and the Social Context of Learning. And this happens to be the 18th topic in the CTET CDP syllabus. As usual, you will find this video both in English and Hindi versions on our channel. In this video series, we are covering only those topics which are important from your exam point of view. However, if you look at uh, the entire CDP syllabus per se, then teaching and learning are probably the two most important topics. And uh, in this video, we are going to be covering a lot of concepts that are connected to teaching and learning. Therefore, this video is going to be quite long. I would suggest that you can pause this video and you can watch it in installments. If you look at uh, the description of uh, any of our uh, videos, then you'll find links to specific chapters. So you can pause the video and restart it or rewatch it from wherever you have stopped. And uh, you'll see that uh, many of the concepts that we will talk about in this video have already been discussed in the previous videos. So this video will also act as a revision for some of the previous discussions that we have already completed. We'll start with understanding what are teaching and learning we we'll look at the basics of teaching, such as levels, maxims, phases. We we'll look at what is a plan and what is a strategy. Then we'll talk about some teaching strategies which are autocratic and democratic in nature. We'll look at some of the important learning theories. Then we'll move on to the basics of learning, such as conditioning, observational, cognitive, etc. We'll talk about what is transfer of learning. And we'll also discuss about universal design for learning. Then we'll move on to children's strategies for learning, learning as a social activity, the seven principles of learning, and we'll end this video with some sample questions from previous question papers. So let's get started. Let us start off by understanding what are teaching and learning. Teaching includes all attempts to bring any kind of a change in a person. If you are trying to change a person's habits, or if you are trying to increase his or her knowledge, or change the way that the person thinks or behaves, or his or her actions, then all of these can be called as teaching because you are trying to change the person, you are trying to teach the person something. So what is learning? So learning is the opposite of this. When there is a change in a person, when the person's habits, skills, knowledge, attitude, thinking, behavior or actions change, then we can say that the person has learned something. Now for a teacher, there should be a student, otherwise who will the teacher teach? But for a student, a teacher is not necessary. A student can learn from other sources as well. Let us look at the basic steps of teaching. First of all, you should have a clear idea about the general and the specific aims or what you are trying to teach. Why is it that you are trying to teach? Why is it that you are trying to teach it to this person? Right? So there should be some clarity around the aims of what you are trying to do. Next, whatever you are trying to teach should be meaningful and contextual. For example, suddenly in the middle of this video, if I start teaching you about the history of ancient Egypt, then it is not contextual because you are not watching this video to learn about ancient Egypt. Right? And it is not meaningful because you are probably not going to have any use by knowing about history of ancient Egypt. So whatever you are trying to teach your students should be meaningful. That is, they should be able to relate to it and connect it to their day-to-day -day life. And it should be contextual as well. And motivation is probably the most important factor here. Because if you cannot motivate your students, then they'll not be able to learn anything whatsoever. So how to motivate students is a skill that all teachers should know. And then we have to talk about content delivery. You have a lesson. You have to teach something. How are you going to deliver it to your students? Will it be a lecture? Will it be theory? Will it be practicals? So you have to decide what mode, what methodology you're going to use to deliver the lessons that you need to teach. After you have taught, you have to reinforce it. For example, if I'm trying to teach about the concept of money, I talk about what is money, what are coins, what are notes to a class full of children. Then I show them some coins and notes and let them touch it, feel them, right? So I'm reinforcing the theory that I'm trying to teach. And then I will send them to a shop so that they can actually use that money and buy something so that they can experience this entire concept of money and how it can be used. So that is nothing but stimulation where you are stimulating their thoughts. Right? And after we have 
followed all these steps we have to revise and practice as well only then the knowledge that we have transferred or what we have taught will become stronger so revision and practice is also very very essential so these are the basic steps of teaching and this is what teaching and learning is all about let us now talk about the different levels of teaching there are three levels of teaching 1 2 and 3 and if you were to put these three levels on a pyramid then at the bottom will be the memory level in the middle will be the understanding level and at the top will be the reflective level now memory level teaching is also called as thoughtless teaching because there is no thinking required here neither the teacher has to think neither the students have to think the entire objective is to get the learners to memorize some content this can be usually useful for some specific type of exams where children have to memorize some standard answers and give those answers in the exam just to clear the exam whether they understand the topic understand the subject understand the questions that is immaterial they just have to remember it now this is also called a rote learning and it should be avoided as far as possible however this rote learning might have some utility in some specific situations right for example at a very junior level if you are trying to teach something to some students where there is no meaning to what you are teaching right you just have to make sure that the children remember something that is where you can use this memory level or thoughtless teaching for example if i am teaching a b c d the alphabets to some children there is no meaning for a there is no meaning for b so i'm just trying to get the children to remember all the alphabets in a particular sequence or an order so in such situations memory level teaching or thoughtless teaching might be useful next comes understanding level or thoughtful teaching here some level of thought has to be given by the teacher and by the students as well now the objective here is to understand the content right for example if i'm trying to teach you the concept of triangles you have to understand the concept of triangles first the concept of area and then you have to remember some facts for example if i have to teach you some formula you first have to understand how the formula works and how you should use it and then you will memorize or remember that formula and then if i am teaching you say geometry and trigonometry then i am also trying to teach you the relationship between different topics or different subjects so here the learners will gain a certain degree of command or expertise over the content they will not become complete experts but they will gain a large amount of expertise now this is useful for all higher level classes whether it is school level teaching degree level teaching or even masters degree level teaching 90% of the teaching that happens in the world happens at a understanding level next comes the reflective level this is also called as the upper thoughtful teaching here the objective is to gain expertise and here the teacher is just acting like a guide for example in research work or project work where the learners are doing the research they are going deep into the subject here the guide is ensuring that the learners stay within the boundaries and they are focusing on the right things so lot of the learning is being done by the learners themselves and this is the highest form of teaching let us now talk about some of the maxims of teaching a maxim means a rule or a guideline so these are some of the important maxims of teaching that you should uh, read remember and understand because very frequently you will see questions based on this in the exam the question may ask that teaching progress from concrete to abstract or abstract to concrete from empirical to rational or rational to empirical induction to deduction or the other way around right? all of these uh, maxims are very simple easy to understand and they are based on common sense for example the first one says from easy to difficult first if i teach you some easy concepts like how gears work then i can teach you something which is more difficult like how a clock which has lot of gears in it how does it work from concrete to abstract first i'll teach you the concept of 1 2 3 which are probably concrete and then i will teach you abstract concepts like x y z from simple to complex first i teach you a simple comp- concept and then i will teach you a more complex concept first i have to teach you the whole that is this entire mechanism is the mechanism of a clock so whole and then i will teach you about the parts of a clock so whole to parts empirical is something that uh, you can observe you can measure and you can understand through experience or experimentation so empirical and then you can use reasoning and logic 
to arrive at a rational conclusion about something so first you learn about what you can see experience observe measure and only then you will learn about things where you have to use reasoning or logic to arrive at an answer analysis to synthesis you can analyze what already exists whereas synthesis means you are creating something new from induction to deduction when you are drinking water using a straw then i can use induction to arrive at a conclusion that you can drink water through a straw and then i can use deduction to say that if you can drink water through a straw and water is a liquid then soup is also a liquid therefore you can drink soup also through a straw so induction is more of observation whereas deduction is a answer or a conclusion based on some reasoning and thought so i start with induction and then move towards deduction from known to unknown first i will teach you about moon stars which you can see which you already know about and then i will teach you about uh, black holes and other concepts which are unknown so you start from known and move towards unknown so these are some of the important maxims of teaching you can pause the video here you can repeat this part or just try to memorize all of these different maxims teaching can be divided into three distinct phases the first is called the pre active phase or the planning phase so here you are making a plan as to what needs to be taught and what strategy will you use to teach your students and then is the interactive phase which is also called the action phase so here you are actually delivering the content to the students using the strategies that you have decided upon and then comes the post active phase this is the evaluation phase where you are analyzing to what extent the students have learned how effective were the strategies that you used is there any change required in the content or the teaching process so first comes the planning phase then the action where you are delivering the lessons and then evaluation to understand how well the teaching process went in cdp we frequently use these two terms plan and strategy for example we talk about a lesson plan and we talk about teaching strategies so we have to understand what is the difference between these two terms so a plan is a high level thought for example my plan might be that i need to go from mumbai to delhi whereas a strategy has more of implementation level details for example if my plan is to go from mumbai to delhi then my strategy will decide whether i am going to use a flight or whether i am going to drive from mumbai to delhi if i am going to drive which route am i going to take so first you decide on the lesson plan what is it that you are going to teach and then you decide on the teaching strategies what methodologies and what exact processes will you use to teach that lesson so now you understand the difference between a lesson plan and teaching strategy let us now talk about teaching strategies now teaching strategies can be divided into three main types teacher centric subject centric and student centric now in teacher centric the teacher is deciding what needs to be taught and how it needs to be taught in subject centric it is a subject or the syllabus which is deciding what needs to be taught and how it will be taught whereas in student centric the students are also participating in deciding how things will work in the classroom what will be taught at what speed so autocratic strategies means that here the teacher is deciding or the subject or the syllabus is deciding and the students are not participating in the decision making process so autocratic you can also call it like dictatorship right whereas in student centric it is called democratic because students are also participating in the decision making process now autocratic and democratic strategies both are important because while we'll say that uh, we should use as many democratic strategies as possible and we should always be student centric even teacher centric and subject centric uh, teaching strategies are also important in some situations so both are important and when we study about these different types of strategies in this video we'll understand how both of them can be used in different types of contexts or situations next let us talk about uh, some of the teaching methods that are used in this different teaching strategies first we'll talk about the autocratic teaching strategies so autocratic can mean teacher centric or subject centric now this autocratic teaching strategies are called autocratic because there is no democracy here they are being run like autocracies and autocracy is like a dictatorship here the teacher or the subject or the syllabus are deciding what needs to be taught 
why it needs to be taught and how it will be taught the learners are not participating in the decision making process these uh, autocratic strategies are also called objective strategies because they are running on the basis of a specific objective the teacher decides how it needs to be taught so the teacher's objectives are priority or the objective might be to complete the syllabus within a specific timeline so that becomes the objective so these are objectivist strategies under autocratic strategies the first is storytelling method here you are trying to tell the entire lesson like a story and the learners are just passive listeners they are just sitting and listening and they are not actively participating in this teaching learning process they are just listening to the story a lecture method is also like a storytelling method but in a lecture you will go more in depth into a particular topic or a particular concept in a lecture method you can also use some slides or presentations but it is very similar to a storytelling method if you have to teach something where you have to give a practical demonstration or conduct an experiment then you will use a demonstration method here again the learners are not actively participating in the experiment or the demonstration they are just passively observing it and then comes the tutorial method in a tutorial method you will divide the classroom into different groups based on their abilities one group may consist of uh, students who are weak in mathematics one group uh, may consist of students who are strong in mathematics and then you will teach those different groups on the basis of their requirement the group which is weak in mathematics might get some additional revision or you might teach them the concepts again and the group which is uh, good in mathematics might get some higher level problems to solve so that way if you divide the class into groups based on their ability and teach them on the basis of their ability that is called the tutorial method when you are using the tutorial method in the tutorial you can use the demonstration method or the lecture method or the storytelling method so these are some of the teaching methods that come under autocratic teaching strategies next let us look at uh, the methods used in democratic teaching strategies so democratic teaching strategies are student centric and they are also called constructivist because here the students are actively constructing the knowledge they are not just passive listeners right they are actively participating in the teaching learning process the first one is discussion method so discussion method is where uh, there is a discussion happening in the classroom and the students and the teacher are actively participating in the discussion and together they are learning something there is a lot of interaction happening in the classroom next is the heuristic method in a heuristic method the teacher gives a problem and encourages or guides the students on how to solve the problem the students do some research by themselves they can uh, experiment with various things and they arrive at a solution for the problem but the teacher is guiding them so that the learners can actively participate in solving that problem then there is a discovery method in a discovery method the teacher just gives the problem and the students or the learners will find the answer or the solution by themselves for example if i tell you tomorrow we need to make a sandwich in the class so i'm leaving it up to you as to figure out how the sandwich will be made what all things you need to make the sandwich with and how to get them where to buy them so i am giving you a problem and you are discovering the solution or the answers to that problem so that is the discovery method so here the difference between discovery method and heuristic method is in discovery method the teacher is not guiding you whereas in a heuristic method the teacher is actively guiding you as well next if you give some project to the students if you form groups of the students and they work with each other and uh, solve a particular project or complete a particular project that's a project method then there is a role playing method one child can play the role of a fire uh, fighter and uh, one child can pl- play the role of a police officer one child can play the role of a doctor and to play that particular role they have to learn what a doctor does what a policeman does what a fire fighter does right so they are learning through playing roles right so that is role playing method then there is a uh, brainstorming brainstorming is also like a discussion method but this is more unstructured so here there are a lot of ideas that are being generated by all the people and all the participants are actively contributing and all the ideas are being debated so brainstorming is like discussion method but it is more unstructured and finally the question and answer method this is also called the socratic method here there are questions and each question has to be answered by the 
learners and the teacher is actively helping them so if you follow the question and answer method that is called the socratic method in one of the next videos we will talk in depth about the socratic method but as of now these are the different teaching methods that are used in the democratic teaching strategy which is the student centric or the constructivist teaching strategies moving on let us talk about some of the important learning theories over the next few slides we'll talk about uh, behaviorism cognitivism constructivism gestalt humanism connectivism transformative social and experiential learning theories now all of these theories are quite simple and easy to understand so let's discuss them one by one let us start with the theory of uh, behaviorism this is a very simple theory and it says that all behaviors are acquired through conditioning and the conditioning can be classical or operant first of all what is this concept of conditioning all about this is something that you might have seen or experienced in real life for example there are some people who have a habit of uh, drinking a hot cup of coffee or tea as soon as they wake up in the morning only after that they will go to the washroom over a period of time their body will get uh, conditioned to such an extent that if they don't drink a hot cup of uh, coffee or tea then they don't get the pressure to go to the washroom at all so that is an example of conditioning now what is classical conditioning if the learner does not have an option of not responding to the stimulus because it is not a response it is more of a reaction right so here if the learner does not have an option and just reacts to the stimulus it is called classical conditioning for example there are some people as soon as they see a lizard in the room they will immediately shout scream or run away from the room so that is a reaction they don't have any control over it they know that the lizard is not trying to come towards them the lizard is not going to hurt them the lizard is just on a wall far away but still as soon as they see the lizard they will react so that is classical conditioning and operant conditioning is where the learner can choose whether he or she wants to respond to the stimulus or not for example there are some people when they see a lizard in the room they will feel uncomfortable but they may choose to either respond or to ignore the lizard if there are some other people in the room and they don't want to create a scene then they might choose to ignore the lizard and continue to sit there if there is nobody in the room then the lizard is making them uncomfortable so they will just get up and walk away so they can control their response to the stimuli so that is operant conditioning and this is what theory of behaviorism is all about next let us talk about the theory of cognitivism so this theory says that uh, the learning is acquisition of knowledge which means that learning is an active process it says that uh, learners absorb information and once they absorb the information they will use some cognitive operations to convert that information into knowledge it might be thinking it might be logic it might be reasoning so they will use such process to convert this information into useful knowledge and after that they will store it in their memory so that it can be used at a later stage so this is the theory of cognitivism let us now talk about the theory of constructivism this theory says that the learners construct meaning through active engagement with the world it can be through interactions experiments or real world problem solving it also says that knowledge cannot simply be transferred from teacher to learner knowledge has to be constructed by the learner himself or herself only information can be transferred for example you can give me a lot of theory on how to ride a cycle but you cannot transfer your knowledge of how to ride a cycle i can take the information that you are giving me i can take your guidance but i still have to actively engage with the cycle i have to actively try it out get some practice only then i'll be able to learn how to ride a cycle so i am actively constructing that knowledge of how to ride a cycle it also says that the learner builds upon his or her previous experience and understanding to construct new understanding for example if i already know how to ride a bicycle and i have to learn how to ride a bike then i use my existing knowledge of how to ride a bicycle how to balance right and then i will add some additional information about gears brake and accelerator and then i'm constructing a new knowledge on how to ride a motorcycle and teacher is only a facilitator in the construction of knowledge that is you cannot teach me how to ride a cycle 
you cannot teach me how to ride a bike you can only give me all the information you can give me the guidance right but the construction of this particular knowledge has to be done by me only as a learner so this is what theory of constructivism is all about where learners actively construct the knowledge in their mind let us now talk about the gestalt theory this is a very very interesting theory and to explain this i will use a simple example one day i was going on the road and i saw one key on the road when i went a little closer i picked up the key i saw that there is a logo which looks like this on the key so here i have two stimuli one which is a key and two which is a logo so i should have had uh, two thoughts the first one is that this is a key which opens some lock and and then i should have seen this logo and said that this is a mercedes benz logo so those are the only two possible thoughts that could have occurred here however when i examined the key a little closely i saw that this doesn't look like a simple lock key this looks like an automobile key and then i saw the logo and i realized that this looks like a mercedes benz logo and because this mercedes benz logo is on this key and this key is an automobile key it probably opens a mercedes benz car and if this key is on the road here it means that somebody has lost it which means that somebody is searching for or looking for this key so instead of just having two thoughts i had so many different thoughts on the basis of these two stimuli this theory says that uh, the result of a set of stimuli is greater than the simple sum so instead of having just two thoughts i had so many different thoughts just because of two stimuli the theory further says that learners should study elements of a subject in relationship with it one another rather than simply memorizing them by themselves so if you are learning any lesson and there are 10 different concepts in that lesson you have to see how those different concepts are connected with each other what is the bigger picture only then you will be able to learn meaningfully you should not just try to remember those concepts or memorize those concepts independent of each other and the theory also says that the human brain makes a map of stimuli caused by life experiences and whenever the brain sees only part of a picture it attempts to create the complete picture so previously if i have seen an automobile key right and i remember that so as soon as i see an automobile key my first thought was that okay this belongs to an automobile right so i can associate a car along with this key so instead of just seeing part of the picture my brain is trying to build a complete picture and when i saw this logo right instead of just telling me that this is a logo the brain is trying to tell me that if this logo is on this key then this key is a mercedes benz key which means that this opens a mercedes benz car right so it is trying to build a much bigger picture than a simple concept here right? so that is what gestalt theory is all about next let us look at uh, this theory called uh, humanism now humanism is a learner centric approach and here the focus is on potential of the learner rather than following a specific set process or material here learners are encouraged to determine their own goals and own pace as well and the teacher will just assist the learners in meeting those learning goals now is this humanism a practical theory is it actually in use anywhere it is for example once upon a time anybody who wanted to do a bachelor of arts degree had to study the same syllabus and complete a ba but then it was decided that some students might have the potential to study a little more right so they were given an option of taking up ba honors right rather than making all students follow the same process on the same material and complete the same ba degree students were given an option of reaching their potential and studying little more in the ba honors degree if you look at uh, ugc's cbcs that is the choice based credit system that is completely based on humanism it says that it is a learner centric system which is what humanism is all about because it is also a learner centric approach right so this choice based credit system says that to complete a degree you need a specific set of credits for example let us assume that you need 30 credits to complete a degree so students are given the independence or they are given an option to choose their own set of subjects they can choose subjects which are at a basic level or at an advanced level depending on their own potential and interest and when they complete all the subjects that are required to meet these 30 credits because each subject will have a specific set of credits 
when they meet this credit requirement then they will automatically get a degree so that way cbcs is giving students the complete independence or the opportunity to maximize their potential it is not forcing everybody to follow the same process on the same material in addition if you look at uh, some of the latest news then ugc now allows students to pursue two degrees and that can be in two separate or two different universities as well so here again students are being given an opportunity to maximize their potential if they have the potential to study only one degree then you can choose that if you have the potential to follow or pursue two degrees then you can choose that so that way humanism is being used more and more in the education system in india next let us talk about uh, the learning theory called connectivism now this is also a very simple theory that we will be able to understand and relate to as well so connectivism says that learners are connected to the world through many ways using technology and that learning happens through all these connections right through all these various sources and it says that learning not just happens in the classroom but it happens through various other sources as well such as social media blogs etc so a human being is connected to the world in different ways and traditionally learning was happening only in the school or in the college but now connectivism says that learning can happen through the internet as well when we are meeting and discussing with people there also some learning is happening when we go through all these social media posts there also some amount of learning can happen when we do some self study we get some learning when we are working and on the job also we get some learning so learning can happen through various sources and we are connected to many of these sources through technology so that is what connectivism is all about next we'll talk about the transformative learning theory transform means to change so this transformative learning theory focuses mainly on adult education and young adult learning and this theory is particularly relevant to older learners this uh, theory says that uh, learners can adjust they can transform or they can change their thinking knowledge and behavior based on new information for example for the older generation getting any work done with a bank meant going to a bank branch standing in a queue if you wanted to get any information about your account you had to get your passbook updated manually if you wanted to draw cash you had to stand in a different queue and draw cash from a cash counter but now all banks have internet banking which means that even the older learners have now transformed or changed they now use internet banking to do all their banking related work so that way people can change people can adapt and people can change their behavior because new information new knowledge has come to them so that is transformative learning next let us talk about the social learning theory so this theory says that uh, learners will observe others and model their own behavior accordingly or change their own behavior accordingly so this theory is mainly applicable for young learners such as uh, children or teenagers or young adults and this change can be positive or it can be negative for example if you are observing somebody and you like that person's behavior you like that person's mannerisms then you might have a positive change in your behavior that is you are also trying to behave in the same way right? or if you see somebody and you don't like that person's behavior right then you will consciously try to avoid such a kind of a behavior so that is a negative change in your behavior and this is what social learning is all about and uh, finally we'll talk about experiential learning theory so this is learning based on experience so the basic concept or the idea behind this theory is that if you hear something you'll forget it if you see something you'll remember it if you do something then you'll understand it so this theory emphasizes both on learning about something and experiencing it so that the knowledge that you have gained can be actually applied in real world situations so this talks about meaningful and contextual learning right? for example if i'm teaching the concept of money right if i just give some lecture to a group of children on what is money what are coins so they are hearing something and they will quickly forget it if i show them some coins and some notes right then they have seen something so they will remember what money is all about but if i give them an opportunity to go to a market and actually use that money to buy something then they have used that knowledge in a real world scenario then they will understand the concept of money better so that is experiential learning 
Before moving on, let's get a little bit of clarity around three terms that we keep using quite frequently in CDP. We talk about learning theories. We also talk about learning types. And we also talk about learning styles. So what are these three different concepts? How are they connected? Well, in learning, there can be types or theories. And I would say that types are more important because types are the actual practical way in which people learn. And if somebody has made a theory using a specific type of learning, then that becomes a learning theory. For example, conditioning is a type of learning. And if somebody has taken conditioning and made a theory out of it, then that becomes a learning theory. But styles are also very, very important because in each of these theories or types, there can be several different styles in which people actually learn. For example, some things can be learned in a verbal mode by talking and some have to be learned through interaction with others. Some things can be learned through indirect experience. That is, you are observing somebody performing an experiment and you can learn through that. But some have to be learned only through direct experience. That is, I can observe somebody riding a cycle, but I cannot learn through such indirect experience. I have to experience it directly to learn how to ride a cycle. So that is direct experience. And some things require a certain level of uh, logic or reasoning or reflection to understand, convert the information into knowledge and learn. And some things like uh, dance or gymnastics can be learned through kinesthetic mode only. Some things can be learned in a sequential manner. You have to complete chapter 1 before you go to chapter 2, then go to chapter 3. Whereas some other things can be learned simultaneously. You can learn two languages simultaneously. Some things can be learned through a visual mode by seeing. Some things can be learned through an auditory mode, that is by hearing. And some things you have to touch, feel and experience, that is tactile. And only then you can learn that. And uh, things like uh, songs or uh, tunes, you can learn through a rhythmic or a melodic mode. So these are the different learning styles that people use. Next, we'll talk about the different types of learning. As you can see here, there is a lot of overlap between the types of learning and the theories of learning and the learning styles that we have already discussed. These are all very easy and simple to understand uh, concepts. And if you understand them, then you'll be able to answer any questions, whether the questions are referring to the theory or the type or the style of learning. We'll start with conditioning, that is classical and operant. Then we'll talk about observational learning, that is imitation, social learning and modeling. Then we'll move on to cognitive learning, that is insight and latent. Then we'll talk about verbal, concept and skill learning. The first type of learning that we'll talk about is called conditioning. Now, as we have already discussed, conditioning is a type of learning where your body gets conditioned to respond to a particular stimulus. Now, conditioning can be classical conditioning or operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, the response is more of a reaction. It can also be called as a reflexive response because you don't have any control over it. For example, if you are very hungry and you see some food, then you will immediately start getting water in your mouth. That is, you'll start getting saliva in your mouth. You don't have any control over that. It automatically happens. Right? So that is classical conditioning. Whereas in operant conditioning, the stimulus will initiate a thought, but responding or not responding to that stimulus is under your control. For example, in summer, you start feeling hot. So this heat is initiating a thought that you should switch on the fan and cool down your body. But whether you choose to switch on the fan or not switch on the fan is under your control. So this is operant conditioning. Next, let us talk about observational learning. In observational learning, the observers, that is, the learners, acquire knowledge by observing the model's behavior. Now, a model can be any person whom you are observing. For young children, the models may be parents, it can be their siblings, that is, brother or sister, or it can be friends or neighbors or teachers. Now, whatever knowledge has been acquired by the observers, the performance of such a knowledge Right? or their actions on the basis of that knowledge depends on whether the model's behavior was rewarded or punished. For example, if there are a group of children playing in a garden and one of the children, he sees that uh, there are some very bright red chilies hanging from a plant. So that uh, child takes that uh, chili and eats it. Now, the observers, that is the other children, know that this chili can be eaten. 
Why? Because they saw the other child eating it, right? So this can be eaten. So they have acquired that knowledge. But then they see that the child who has eaten the chilli starts crying. Why? Because the chilli was very spicy. Right? So now they have acquired the knowledge that this chilli can be eaten, but they will not perform the same action. Here, they will refrain or they will stop themselves from doing the same thing because they know that if they eat the chilli, they will be punished by that hot spicy chilli. So that way, the knowledge that is acquired by observing can result in positive action or negative action. So observational learning can be imitation, social learning or modeling. Next, we'll talk about cognitive learning. In cognitive learning, there is a change in what the learner knows rather than what the learner does. That is, there is a change in knowledge and not in action. For example, if I see somebody using a calculator to solve some mathematics problems. Now, I know that a calculator can be used in mathematics. but I might not actually use a calculator. So which means that my knowledge has changed, it has improved, but my actions have not changed. Here, we'll talk about insight learning and latent learning. So insight learning is where I have an insight based on some previous experience or previous knowledge. For example, long back I had seen somebody using a small stick to pluck some flowers. Next time when I went to a mango orchard, I saw a mango tree which had lots of mangoes. Right. Because I had previously seen somebody using a stick to pluck flowers, I realized that I can use a longer stick to pluck mangoes as well. So that is an insight I had and that insight was based on my previous experience or my previous knowledge. And next comes latent learning. Latent learning just says that my learning is latent. It is in a sleeping or a pause state till I actually have to use it. For example, it was many, many years ago that I saw somebody using a stick to pluck flowers and that knowledge and that experience was latent in my mind. Right? It was just there somewhere stored. And it was only when I went to a mango orchard right? and I saw the mangoes on the tree and I realized that I had to pluck these mangoes. Only then I remembered the previous incident and I used that incident as a model as to what I can do in this new situation. So I used my previous experience to convert it into knowledge that can be used in the new situation. Right? So the learning was latent till I actually had to use it. So this is what cognitive learning is all about. Next, we'll talk about verbal learning. In verbal learning, the learning is happening through words and associations. For example, if I tell a child, don't put your finger in the flame because it will burn. It is very hot. Now, the child is associating some words and their meanings. For example, the child understands the word hot and the word burn and he is associating it with the word pain because the burning or the heat will cause pain. So here, the child does not have to put his or her finger into the candle flame to experience it. Right? The child already knows what will happen if he or she puts her finger in the flame. So the child is learning verbally without actually experiencing it. Next, let us talk about concept learning or conceptual learning. Now, a concept is a high level idea. It is like a category under which there can be a number of objects, events or things. For example, when I make the statement that fruits are good for you because fruits have lot of vitamins. The statement that fruits have lot of vitamins is a conceptual statement. It is a high level statement. It does not go into the details because fruits can mean any of these all of them come under the concept of fruits. They all look different, they all taste different, but still they are all fruits. And fruits have lot of vitamins. Now, vitamin is again a high level concept because vitamins can be A, B, C, D, E, whatever. So I'm not talking about any specific vitamin here. I'm just making a high level statement without going into the details. So concept learning means high level learning without going into the details. Next, let us talk about skill learning. Now, skill is the ability to perform some complex task in a smooth and efficient manner. For example, if you can drive a car very well, right? it means that you are skilled at driving a car. If you can ride a bicycle very well, then that is also a skill that you have developed with lots of practice. So a skill can be learned only through hands-on or experiential mode. A skill cannot be learned through theory. I can give you lots of theory around how a car works, how different parts of a car work. However, till you actually learn to drive, 
till you actually practice on real roads and till you get some amount of experience you cannot be skilled at driving a car so that is skill learning next let us talk about the concept of transfer of learning transfer of learning means that uh, the knowledge or skills that are learned in one context may be transferred or applied in new contexts as well for example when i was a kid i learned how to ride a bicycle i learned how to balance how to go through traffic and later on when i was uh, learning how to ride a motorcycle then i could transfer some of my knowledge and skills from riding a bicycle to learning how to ride a motorcycle now transfer of learning can be positive negative or neutral for example the knowledge and the skills that i learned while riding a bicycle definitely helped me in a positive way when i was trying to learn how to ride a motorcycle that was a positive transfer because it was helpful in india the driver sits on the right side of the car and we drive on the left side of the road so my knowledge and skills of driving a car in india are negatively affecting my ability to drive a car in the us because in us the driver sits on the left side of the car and they drive on the right side of the road so my indian knowledge skills and experience is actually hindering it in a negative way so that is negative transfer and neutral transfer means my existing knowledge and skills if they are not affecting my new knowledge or skills then there is no interaction there is no effect so that is neutral now this uh, transfer of learning is explained by two main theories the first one is uh, el thorndike's theory of identical elements for example if i can drive a tvs uh, scooter then i can also drive a honda scooter because both of them are identical both of them have the same kind of accelerator the same kind of brake both of them look similar as well so there is identical elements between these two and charles judd's theory of a generalization of experience talks about uh, this transfer on a more higher level he says that in general if there is a similarity between the previous situation and the new situation or the previous context and new context then there is a transfer of learning that happens for example if i can ride a two wheeler then i can ride any two wheeler because in general there are a lot of similarities between these two so that is transfer of learning next we'll talk about children's strategies of learning now children learn by employing various strategies that help them to understand to reason to memorize and to solve problems for example if you send a child to a market and uh, tell the child that uh, you need to get these five items from that shop then the child probably will keep repeating the list to himself or herself because that is a way that they can remember or memorize that list or there are mnemonics for example my very educated mother just showed us nine planets which is mercury venus earth mars jupiter saturn uranus neptune pluto so this mnemonic can be used to remember the names of all the planets in the correct order similarly there are abbreviations like board mass which help you in solving problems right so board mass is an abbreviation for braces and then orders then division multiplication addition and subtraction so strategies can be used in all fields they can be used in maths in science and in languages so teachers must recognize the importance of such strategies right and teachers can also teach strategies to children so strategies may be taught directly or indirectly directly such as uh, when you give them an assignment to read a lesson or read a poem then you can teach them how to outline how to underline how to summarize things how to annotate or highlight text and you can also do it indirectly by giving them a group task and guiding them with examples so that they learn on their own and uh, in science children should learn how to form hypothesis so hypothesis is the basic idea that they are trying to prove so they should know how to come up with a hypothesis because that itself is a strategy of learning and they should know how to methodically record their work and results how can they do it in a structured manner right and uh, they should uh, know the steps that they can use to analyze and evaluate data and information and uh, in many times uh, children may also develop their own strategies and if the teacher comes to know of any such strategies then they should not be discouraged on the other hand such strategies should be encouraged and the teacher should ask the child to explain what the strategy is all about so that if the strategy is useful then the same thing can be taught to other students 
and if there are any issues or problems with that strategy for example it may work in one situation it may not work in other situations so in such situation such a case the teacher should correct the strategy if required therefore children's strategies of learning means that children create their own strategies for learning or they can learn strategies for learning so such strategies should be encouraged because this is part of the learning process let us now talk about learning as a social activity that is the social context of learning now we have already discussed about this in many of our previous videos because we know that learning is a social activity even when we were discussing lev vygotsky's uh, cognitive development theory we discussed about how social factors are also very very important along with cultural factors and linguistic factors so we learn from each other and we also learn with others when we are interacting with others we build on each other's experiences and understanding if i teach you something if i give you some knowledge or some information then you can build on top of it and you can improve it so the next person who learns from you will use your knowledge and information to improve it to take it to the next level so we build on each other's experiences and understanding as a society we learn behaviors and skills by observing others so this is something that we discussed in observational learning we take part in communities that influence our identity so my identity may be influenced by my family by my friends group by my college or my school and uh, my religion so all such social factors influence our identity so we should encourage social learning because learning is a social activity and there cannot be too much of a learning without social interaction so how can we encourage social learning well we should support the group in creating meaningful relationships for example in schools there are groups which are created or there are houses which are created such as red house green house yellow house blue house right such groups are created so that children are given an opportunity to identify themselves with a particular group and learn from others as well they can interact in a more social way and we should support collaborative learning in the classrooms as well we should give as many group tasks and group assignments as possible and uh, we should explore and include the wisdom of the group that is when we conduct activities like a group discussion or uh, brainstorming then we see that the wisdom of the group is working one person might come up with an idea the next person takes that idea and improves upon it the third person may look at the idea from a different point of view so it is a collective wisdom of the group which is improving the solution to that problem or to that question and we should allow children some space to learn from each other we should not discourage children from interacting with each other right so children should be taught all social skills because they are very very essential so this way learning is a social activity and social factors are very very important in the cognitive development of a person and we should understand and we should encourage the social context of learning next let me talk about the seven principles of 21st century learning which were released by the organization for economic cooperation and development now these are not very important but these seven principles are a summary of what the teaching learning process is all about for example the first one says learners at the center that is all learning should be student centric it should not be teacher centric it should not be subject centric it should be student centric and the social nature of learning should be understood and encouraged because learning is a social activity and emotions are integral to learning that is emotions are very very important for learning if the learner is not emotionally ready if the learner is not motivated then the teaching process will not work learning will not happen and we should recognize individual differences every learner is different and we should stretch all students we should keep them challenged we should keep them motivated right we should encourage them to go to the next level and do better than what they have done yesterday and then we should use assessment for learning we should not use too much of assessment as learning or assessment of learning but assessment for learning is very very important and building horizontal connections that is we should build a connection between the different subjects that the students are learning we should have a connection between the mathematics between the social science between the science so that way students are able to build a more holistic knowledge therefore these are the seven important principles of 21st century learning and finally let us talk about the universal design for learning now udl is important because we sometimes see 
questions based on this UDL. So what is this UDL or Universal Design for Learning? So UDL is a framework for how to develop lesson plans and assessments. Right? So there are three main principles of UDL. The first one is about engagement. The second one is about a representation. And the third one is about action and expression. If they sound a little complicated, just go through the details and you'll see that they are very, very simple and easy to understand. For example, the first principle, engagement, is about motivating the learners and sustaining their interest, that is maintaining their interest. If you don't motivate your learners and if you can't maintain their interest, then you can't teach anything. So that is common sense. So how do you motivate learners and how do you keep them interested in the classroom? Well, you have to include learners in all the decisions. So this is nothing but using democratic teaching strategies and you have to give them relevant assignments and examples. That is the examples and the assignments must be something that they can relate to and understand in the context of their real life or day to day life. And learning must be a fun activity. If it is boring, then they won't be interested. And you should allow learners to get up and move around. In a traditional classroom, students are expected to sit in one place without moving for long periods of time. But that makes them get very bored, especially children. So you should make sure that your classroom gives an opportunity for learners to get up and walk around every now and then. Then we come to representation. Representation means that whatever we are teaching, whatever information we are trying to give the children in the classroom, we should give it in more than one format. We should use audio, we should use video, right? because that is the only way we can keep them interested. and. We should give importance to hands-on learning because hands-on and experiential learning is the best way to learn. And coming to action and expression, it says that we should allow for more than one way to interact with the material. In one of the previous slides, we discussed about how there are different types of learning styles. There can be visual, there can be auditory, there can be sensory or tactile. Right? So we should provide opportunity for different students with different learning styles to interact with the material in the classroom. So we can give them lots of written assignments, which takes care of the written learning. And we can give them oral reports. We can give them presentations so that they work in groups and they learn through group activity and social interactions. And we can give them group projects as well. So these are all some of the ways in which we can use universal design for learning to make the learning and teaching process interesting in the classroom. Let us now solve some questions from previous question papers. The first question is multiple pedagogical techniques, assorted learning material, multiple assessment techniques and varying the complexity and nature of the content are associated with which of the following. We just discussed about uh, universal design for learning. So this is not talking about UDL. This is also not referring to remedial teaching because in remedial teaching, you identify the gaps in the learner's knowledge or the weak areas and you conduct some classes or sessions only to address those areas like special tuitions or tutorials. So this is not remedial teaching. And in reciprocal teaching, the students also get to play the role of a teacher. That is in small groups, each student is trying to teach something to the other student. So the students are teaching each other. They are acting as if they are the teacher for that small group. So this is not referring to reciprocal teaching as well. So now if we are using different pedagogical techniques, if we are using different types of learning material and different types of assessment techniques, then we are talking about differentiated instruction here. Because we know that every learner is different and every learner's requirements are different. So we are using different techniques and material and assessment techniques to meet the requirement of the different types of learners in our classroom. So this is differentiated instructions. Which of the following factors supports learning in a classroom? The first one is increasing the number of tests to motivate children to learn. Now tests are assessment of learning and we should not be using more of assessment of learning. We should be using assessment for learning. So by increasing the number of tests, we are not going to motivate the children. We are just going to make them more afraid. We are going to give them unnecessary tension. So this is not a correct answer. Next, sticking to one particular method of instruction to maintain uniformity. So if we use only one pedagogical technique, right, then it means that some of the children who are not able to learn through that pedagogical technique will not learn anything at all. So this is also not a good idea because 
we have to use multiple pedagogical techniques in the classroom and increasing the time interval of uh, periods from 40 minutes to 50 minutes so if we increase the time from 40 minutes to 50 minutes if children are bored they will have 10 more minutes to get bored so this is not going to help in learning in the classroom therefore this also is not a correct answer so we are left with one option that is supporting the autonomy of the children by the teacher so this is talking about democratic teaching strategies where children are also getting some participation in the decision making process and they are getting the support of the teacher so this is a learner centric strategy and this is the correct answer which will support learning in the classroom which one of the following is an example of a learning style in this video we discussed about different learning styles and if you look at uh, the answer options visual is a learning style but this question is wrong because tactual means tactile which means that there are two possible correct answer here so this question should have been challenged so sometimes you have to be careful to make sure that if there are more than one correct answer choose one but later on you can challenge this question learning experiences should be planned in a manner so as to make learning meaningful which of the given learning experiences does not facilitate meaningful learning for the children now you have to make sure that you don't miss out on reading the does not because if you miss that out you will end up selecting the wrong answer which means that there are three learning experiences which facilitate meaningful learning and there is one which does not facilitate meaningful learning now presentation on the topic that is a audio visual technique and that is a good way of meaningful learning next discussion and debate on the topic this is also a good way of ensuring meaningful learning formulating questions on the content this is also a good way of ensuring meaningful learning repetition based on mere recall of the content so now mere recall of the content is nothing but rote learning and rote learning is not recommended and rote learning does not allow for meaningful learning therefore the answer is option 1 that is repetition based on mere recall of content does not allow for meaningful learning a teacher can help the children to process a complex situation by doing which of the following now what is a complex situation a complex situation may be a difficult mathematics problem or a complicated physics experiment so how can the teacher help the children process and to understand such difficult situations or complex situations the first one is encouraging competition and offering a high reward to the child who completes the task first now here the teacher is just making the children compete against each other and children probably are getting unnecessarily tensed about this situation and the child who actually understands it will probably complete the task first and the rest of the children might not understand anything at all so this is definitely not a good technique next not offering any help at all so that children learn to help on their own now the children are actually stuck they are confused because this is a complex or a very difficult situation so not offering any help at all and letting the children try to help themselves is not a good technique the teacher has to intervene next giving a lecture on it now lecture is a very boring uh, experience for most children so which means that giving a lecture is definitely not a good option next breaking the task into smaller parts and writing down the instructions now if you have a complex problem by breaking it down into smaller parts children can easily understand each of these smaller parts and by writing down instructions children can understand what needs to be done in each part of this complex situation so option 4 is the correct answer and the best answer among the given options and uh, with that we have come to the end of this video if you have any questions or feedback please put them in the comment section below and i will see you again very soon in the next video till then take care stay safe